Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is President Tom Katsuleas. I'd like to welcome all of you to this virtual town hall uh, for international students. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. I hope there are many of you out there listening. Uh, we are very proud of being a global university. We're very proud to have so many international students. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the points of pride at, at Freshman Welcome this year was to point out that we were the number 17th most global entering class among freshman classes in the country in the United States. And of course, we have many more students from around the world in our graduate classes. So thank you all for being here. Uh, one of the reasons for having this meeting is uh, to show our support for you. We, we know that this global pandemic has been hard on everybody, but it has been especially hard for our international students. And this is for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, many of you are far away from home and family and loved ones who would be available to support you right now. Uh, secondly, many of you, you know, over months have been worried about your family and loved ones who were in hotspots overseas. And uh, finally, we know that you've experienced acts of bias and bigotry and ignorance from uh, uh, members of uh, the, the American community at times. And um, we are, are grievous of that. And um, we want you to know in uh, particular uh, that we support you and that we care about you. And so the purpose of this meeting, if, if uh, I may, is threefold. Uh, I'm going to introduce it and then I'm going to hand it off uh, to our Vice President for Global Affairs, Dan Wiener, um, to um, questions, but the goals here are to show show you our support, uh, to answer any questions you might have uh, to, the, to our, the best of our abilities. There are questions we all have that we, none of us have the answers to uh, without a crystal ball, but we'll do our best. And we have a, an expert panel uh, who's prepared to, to answer in their areas of expertise. And of course, finally, to listen to anything that you might want to tell us and, um, and hear how you're doing. So I, before I get started, I do want to, to um, make a couple of notes of thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say special thanks to uh, the Asian American community in Connecticut, the parents of Chinese students here at UConn, uh, alumnus Alex Hu, and Chinese partner institutions. Th those groups, the four of them collectively have donated thousands of dollars in personal protection equipment that is much needed and in short supply to UConn Health. And I think it's a great example of how we are all connected by a common sense of humanity and uh, the common desire to reach out and help others and relieve human suffering. And so I can't thank all of you enough. Um, it's a wonderful act of generosity and it means a lot to UConn Health. I've heard from the caregivers there how much it means to them. The second thank you I'd like to give is to members of the um, UConn faculty and staff who have volunteered for a new program that you're gonna hear a little bit more about called U Kindness. Uh, this is a, a, a program created to counter some of the bias that our international students have experienced uh, by replacing that those biased and negative experiences with supportive virtual encounters. And so there are, there are a group of over 100 faculty and staff who are uh, looking for opportunities to uh, connect with, with, with you and, uh, and show their support. And so I encourage you to take advantage of it if it's appealing to you. Uh, you know, I've been using this tagline that uh, UConn Nation is physically distant, but socially and globally connected. And um, that, that has never been more true. And um, we're, we're so happy to be to connect, connected to you now. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our um, Vice President for Global Affairs, our very talented Dan Wiener. So Dan, will you take it? Thank you very much, President Castellius. Um, we appreciate your time, we appreciate your support, and we know this is an issue that you feel very, um, very important to you, so thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today with the group, and let me start by introducing the panel. We have Scott Jordan, the Executive Vice President for Administration, and the Chief Financial Officer. We have Nathan First, our Vice President for Enrollment Planning and Management. Eleanor Dowdy, Associate Vice President of Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Jeffrey Schulson, Vice Provost for Academic Operations. Ken Holsinger, Vice Provost for Graduate Education. 
and Dean of the Grad School, Angela Roja, Director, the Asian American Cultural Center, and Ray Alexander, the Director for International Student and Scholar Services. So we have an all-star cast for you today. I um, want to thank you all for bringing so many questions to us, a lot of really interesting and important questions, and we've put them together into different categories. Let me also mention that we will be attempting to answer your questions live as well, as, as much as time will allow, and people are going to be texting me some of your questions um, as we're trying to do all of this virtually. So the first set of questions um, around student affairs and issues around housing. Um, you all have a lot of questions about housing, which makes a lot of sense since we're all at home. So let me start there. Um, first question is, does the university commit to housing students who have been approved to stay on campus through at least May 10th? Thanks, Dan. And yes, the agreements we made for students remain in place. So if you were approved to stay on to stay in housing from um, spring break through the conclusion of the term, that's right. The date is different depending on where you live, um, with the earliest date being um, that May 10th date for our students, and then there are later dates throughout May for our students living in a Thank you, Ellie. The second housing question is, will the university provide an on-campus housing and dining service to students who cannot return home this summer due to the pandemic? We will. And for students who um, are in that position, which we know exists, that you can't return home over the summer and you want to be in housing through the summer, you'd apply for housing through the Residential Life site. And there will be um, a dining plan in place, and the dining plan will continue to be consistent with the guidelines that we receive. So right now, it's takeout dining, and then if we can, over the course of the summer, we'll build that out as well. Let me also take this time to welcome our Vice President for Student Affairs, Michael Gilbert. Thank you, Michael, for coming today. Um, third question is, will students who are approved to remain on campus through summer be allowed to stay in the current rooms to reduce population density? So, so that's one where we're not going to be able to answer that until we know all of the students who want to remain on campus for summer housing. So you can give me that information by applying through Res Life. Some of you already have, and that's wonderful. But we want to make sure you're housed on campus, and then we want to make sure you're housed in a way that will be comfortable for the summer months. So if you're not living in an air conditioned building now, we're probably going to want to move you. But your safety will always be on our minds as we make those assignments for the summer. Thank you, Ellie. Can students who attend regional campuses request on campus housing in stores? So you can this summer. Um, I understand that we have some students in the regionals who won't be able to get home. And if that's the case, of course you can apply to stores. We don't wanna leave you without a place to stay and stores will be able to accept housing applications for students at any of our regional campuses, um, including Stanford as well. And we need to make some decisions about Stanford because those are spaces that we are sharing to meet state needs. But if you need a bed and um, you'd like to stay with us at stores, we'd welcome the application. We're not going to leave anybody without a place to stay. Thank you. And one more housing question. What kind of help can the university provide to students who are trying to find fall housing from overseas because they return home due to COVID-19? So we continue to make fall housing available to students. Um, right now we're going through the housing selection process for our returning students. So just contact Res Life and let them know um, that you'll need a place to stay for the fall term. And I have a text message here with a question. Um, does the university prefer students to go home for summer vacation or stay in America on campus? Well, let me say that that is a personal decision. Um, other people might want to weigh in on that, but that's a great question. You know, I'd only chime in given my understanding of how hard I know this is for some students to be away from their families. I know I've had a chance to visit some of you in the residence halls and I'm grateful for the community you've been building, but we want you to know there's always a place for you at UConn. And if you also need to make a personal choice to see your family, maybe family you haven't seen for some time, we completely respect that, but we're not going to leave you without a place to call home during this time. 
I think that's a really appropriate answer. And as you all know, there are some both logistical issues around travel. So before you make any plans, please check in with ISSS regarding you know, these logistical questions and the questions. Um, the next question is a really important question around bias. Um, have, have bias incidents towards Yukon's Chinese student population been reported? How does the university respond? And I know that, Angela, you also have some things to say about that issue as well. So I'm happy to start what is a really important conversation for us to have um, as a community globally and then very specifically at the Yukon population. So we always have in place the bias response protocol, which is an opportunity for you to tell us that something is happening and allow us to review that within the resources that we have. So that's taking care of you and your needs. That's making sure our police are aware um, and making sure when it's another student involved that conduct is aware as well. I can tell you though, the bias reports have been small. Three, I think that have been directly related to this, but I don't think we should be accepting that as how students are feeling right now. The media coverage and the stories we're collecting from staff who are trusted by students and students are sharing their stories says there's a lot more concern for students feeling welcome on our campus, in our community, um, and throughout the country. And that will always be our priority. So a few things for us to think about is always know that bias response protocol is there for you, COVID or no COVID. We want to make sure we're responding, that we know about these incidents, and that we're supporting you in every way that we can. Um, the president mentioned early you kindness, and that is absolutely an initiative where we want to build connection and care with all of you right now. Whether you're living on campus or you're off campus nearby, um, or you're a world away right now, we want you to know that that connection and care exists for you. And so the You Kindness website, which you can access, will tell you about ways to stay connected with UConn from Friday chats that we're having to work that we're doing through international students and scholars. Uh, but also specifically, I'd call your attention to the Husky Links Initiative, where we have had so many staff and faculty volunteer and say they would love to reach out to a student, connect with them, and be a source of community for them. So let us know. You can let us know through the Husky Links initiative. You can also just email me at Dean of Students, which is easy, and we'll connect you with those people who truly care and want you to know how much you matter. That's where we are now, but there is more that we're doing as well. And I know Angela has some work through the center that she wanted to share. Thanks, Ellie. And I want to say hello to all of the students who are joining us today, as well as my other colleagues on the panel. Um, in addition to all of the wonderful things that Student Affairs and Global Affairs are doing to connect us together, um, later this month, the Cultural Center, along with the Asian and Asian American Studies, will be hosting community chats. Um, and these are going to be small groups of people talking about the things that are affecting them the most today. Um, if there are issues that you're having, um, if you're involved in bias incidences, I can't stress enough the importance to report them. If they're happening on campus, again, going through our Dean of Students bias reporting protocol. If it's happening in um, off campus, you need to report it to your local authorities. Um, and there are some national places where we are uh, in the Asian American community collecting that data. If you go to our website, asac.ucon.edu, you will see a letter to the community that was posted last week, and it has a list of those resources. But pay attention to the Student uh, Daily Digest as well as the Faculty and Staff Digest um, as we will be rolling out those community chats later on this month, and we hope that you will join us. Again, they will be small so that you'll have the intimacy of sharing your story. Um, and we're here to support you. You can contact any of our staff at the Cultural Center and the Studies Institute, and we're happy to be there for you. Thank you very much to both of you. And let me just add that um, even though we're all 
decentralized here. We're all at home and physically distant from each other. We're trying very hard to stay connected with you. Um, there are over 3,000 international students and visiting scholars that are that have stayed in Connecticut or in the region. That's a large number, and we really want you to reach out to us as we reach out to you. That's a very important message. If you're feeling isolated, you're feeling lonely, um, just reach out. There's lots of resources available, and fortunately, we have this great thing called the internet where we can all continue to communicate with each other. So the next set of questions are around health and wellness. Um, we have a question that came live, which is an important question. Are there COVID cases on campus? Um, I can say that I am aware of the fact that there are some members of the community, the UConn community, that have tested positive. That's different than saying on campus. Um, I'm happy to talk a bit about that, Dan. So, um, uh, no. There are no positive COVID cases on campus. And as you know, student health and wellness is providing primary care for the campus, as well as students um, like many of you who are off campus and close by and need that care. So I'm, I'm able to tell you that we're not aware of any um, cases on the campus. We are vigilant. Um, we do have the ability to isolate students if they're symptomatic, and we've done that when the need calls for it. Um, but no, our campus is pretty healthy. Um, to Dan's point, COVID is touching us though. And so we know that there are students in the greater community off campus who have been diagnosed. We know the same for some faculty and staff that we care about. And for the students, they can always get care and guidance um, from us through the student health um, COVID lines that are available on their website. The next question is, if a, if a student has symptoms of COVID-19, who should they contact? We'd really like you to contact Shaw wherever you are in the world. So student health and wellness would be um, the person I'd like you to contact medically so we're aware of your care. It also helps us in case there are other students that you were around that we want to keep an eye on as well. They have 24-7 availability to you and those phone numbers are available on the student health and wellness site as well as on the sites that the university has created for COVID. Another question, can the dining hall offer meals to students at the residential halls to limit exposure for students? We can and do deliver meals to students that were isolating. So students where there is a known risk to the community and um, we do that when, when we need to and have done that already in the past. Those students ended up not being positive, but that's okay. We wanted to take those precautions. We're not able to do that for the entire campus community. Um, those students who are living with us now, as well as students who may be with us in the summer, um, but we will certainly do it as um, it's medically necessary for us to do that. Thank you. Before we move on to the next set of questions, a couple of housing questions came up. So I think I'll go back to them because they're important. Um, the first question is, um, do all the housing discussions include graduate students? Yeah, so this university has formed work groups that are charged with particular outlooks as it relates to our COVID response. Um, there is a work group focusing specifically on student needs like housing. And we do have representation from Graduate Student Affairs, as well as ISSS and a number of other key departments um, in those conversations. Thank you. And the second question, will summer housing prices apply to us if we're staying on campus? There will be costs associated with summer housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next set of questions are for, around academic affairs, and we'll ask Vice Provost Jeffrey Schulson to answer those questions, but obviously anybody in the panel is welcome to as well as we move forward. If we get sick with COVID-19, how can we keep up with our courses? Are there academic <laughs> Okay. Uh, are we better now? That there was a little bit of a disturbance there. Yep, we're all good. Did you hear the question? Should I do it again? Yes, please repeat it. Thanks. If we get if we get sick with COVID-19, how can we keep up with our courses? Are there academic accommodations we should be aware of? 
So I'll say this about our instructors. They have been uh, enormously responsive to the challenges involved in this, uh, in this effort, and they are certainly aware of the possibility that this sickness could, could uh, hit one of our students. Uh, and I would say that the first thing to do if you happen to fall ill is to make sure your instructor knows. Uh, let them know that you are, you are sick. Let them know that you are uh, uh, unable to continue with the work. Um, and if you can, also let your, know, your advisor know, know this as well. Um, incompletes are an option. If it becomes difficult for you to finish the work for the rest of the semester, they are there as, uh, precisely for this sort of uh, exigency or this sort of emergency. Uh, certainly no one expects you to sacrifice your health or to put yourself at risk to do more than you can do if you're feeling sick. The most important thing that you need to do is to take care of yourself to take care of your health and to seek the help that you, you can get for your health. Uh, and the, the questions of academic completion can be taken care of once you recover. We want you first to think about your, your health and, uh, and your wellness, and then we'll take care of the academic issues after that. Thank you. Will summer term courses be held entirely online? When will the university decide and announce plans for summer term coursework? Uh, we have just made a decision uh, to have our summer one classes, that is to say the summer classes that begin on June 1, to go online. Uh, that's a process that is now unfolding. Instructors who are expecting to teach summer one face-to-face uh, -face as opposed to online are now being asked to make the plans necessary to, to, to do the, uh, the pivot to online instruction. We have not yet made the decision about summer two, the session that begins on July 13th. We expect to be making that decision in the next several weeks. Um, uh, certainly by May 1, we would have that, that decision made. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about the fall. One is, when will we make a decision about the fall? This is, of course, something we're all thinking about and talking about. And the second part of that question is, what academic, what academic options will continuing international students have in the fall if they have traveled home and cannot return as planned? Well, I think you already heard a little bit from President Katsalais at the beginning of this uh, town hall about the fall. Uh, we are not yet ready to make any formal and final decisions about the fall, but it's certainly something that we're thinking about and planning for, for various possible scenarios. Um, and they can include back to full operations, but they can also potentially include some version of online instruction, maybe some mixture of online and face-to-face. -face. These are all options that we have to consider because we, we want to be able to make the responsible decision about, uh, about what to do, responsible with respect to the health of our students and our instructors and our staff, but also with, responsible with respect to the academic mission we have to you. Um, as far as uh, international students who might have, be challenged by not being able to return to campus if they choose to go home, we're very much aware that that's a possibility. Uh, and we are uh, working through scenarios to be able to address that as well. Even if we do go back to face-to-face -face instruction in the fall, we know that there's a possibility that some of our international students will be unable to return at the start of the semester. And we'll be working with the instructors in those classes to ensure that the students are not uh, unnecessarily penalized or challenged because they can't get back uh, in time for the beginning of the semester. Thank you. So the next set of questions around financial matters. And we'll ask Scott Jordan, Nathan first to take the lead on those, but others might want to participate as well. Will the university adjust the tuition fee for spring semester due to course offerings moving online? Um, good afternoon, uh, this is Scott Jordan. Um, the university will not be adjusting its tuition uh, because the tuition pays for the provision of those courses, um, and we are continuing to offer instruction online. Uh, the university is providing uh, refunds for housing and dining uh, on a prorated basis for those students who have uh, left the uh, uh, residential life system. Thank you. Will the university refund fees for services that are no longer accessible? When will refund take place? Uh, so for, the, for those services, for principally housing and dining, but also including uh, student parking and uh, uh, fees associated with uh, uh, 
education abroad for students that were uh, forced to return home. Um, the University of Bursar is in the process of uh, uh, processing those refunds now. Uh, we would expect that students should see a credit on their uh, fee bills uh, by early May. Uh, and when they receive the credit on their bill, uh, students will have the opportunity to either uh, maintain that credit uh, for a future semester or for summer uh, programs or, uh, uh, or any really to satisfy any uh, financial obligation to the university. Uh, or to, if in the case of uh, financial need, to apply for a cash refund, uh, that application can be made online on the Bursar's website, um, or uh, to uh, donate their uh, refund uh, to the Students First Fund, uh, which is the uh, uh, fund that the University Foundation maintains to help students in need uh, with unusual expenses. Uh, and we expect that there are quite a few students now who have some need uh, uh, based on the um, coronavirus uh, situation. So those are the three options to, to roll your credit into a future semester, um, take it as a cash refund or donate it to the Students First Fund. And all of those options are on the Bursar's website. So here's a question that just came in. If embassies are closed and international students can't get here in the fall, how does the university plan to deal with the significant drop of enrollment? Yeah, I'm happy to take that uh, question. So uh, obviously we're watching that situation as others here have suggested very, very carefully. And I actually believe that we'll be in a position if that were to be the case to offer a number of options to our students such that they could complete their coursework uh, and a variety of other experiences online and remotely. And so those things are being worked on um, as we speak. Um, we'll share them as they become available. That's not to say that there won't be an impact to enrollment, but all of those conversations also are, are being held between finance and the division of enrollment um, as we try to project and, and estimate what the potential impact may be. And here's a question that, Scott, you started to answer. We, I want to ask it again so it's some clarity. What potential financial aid can the, can the school offer to international students who suffer economic hardship as a result of the pandemic? I would encourage all any student that's uh, facing financial need to uh, get in touch with the uh, financial aid office uh, at the university. We have uh, uh, set aside funds to help students in need, both uh, institutional funds and the Student First Fund. Um, and Nathan First can provide more detail on that. Um, we're um, also uh, uh, in the process of trying to understand better the uh, the the funding that the federal government has provided us to provide uh, aid to students. Um, and as we know more about that program, uh, we will be putting it on the website. So just to add that any student is eligible for uh, assistance from the financial aid office and or the Students First Fund and simply needs to email financialaid at uconn.edu. We'll review uh, your case um, as they come in and uh, do whatever we can to assist students. It is worth noting that uh, since we're, this is an international uh, student forum, uh, that it is not necessary that um, you would have submitted a FAFSA uh, or filed a FAFSA with us. So we're actually in a position uh, to provide some support to students facing financial hardship um, who are not federal financial aid um, applicants. And I'll add, um, and we continue to run the Yukon Swipes program for students who donate meal swipes for us to give to students who are food insecure. And that will continue throughout the summer. I know next week will be a gift of donating swipes if you wish, if you have swipes remaining on your balance. Um, and all of these things bundle together to help us meet sort of those unanticipated needs that folks are now facing. Thank you. Will the university consider offering free or reduced cost housing and dining services this summer if students cannot return home due to COVID-19 or cannot afford summer housing slash dining rates? Um, as, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> I think we're going to say the same thing, which is that if, if a student needs a place to stay for the summer, the student should apply for summer housing. And, that, and we are here for you. Um, 
if the if you can't afford uh, the summer housing fee, you should you should contact the financial aid office, um, and we will do our best to meet your need. Right, Nathan? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. So a question just came in um, related to academic affairs and the graduate school. Um, can the university mandate pass fail if no mandate for students applying for med school? It could be difficult. UMass mandated it. The question is, what does it mean for grad students trying to go to med school pass fail? At the graduate level. If you can't, you can answer that question. Yeah, so I'll take that. I think there's two parts to this question. One is whether pass fail is available, and then the second is whether it's mandated. And the, the university senate did not mandate pass fail for undergraduates. On Monday, the Graduate Faculty Council approved a pass fail option for graduate students, so it will be available to graduate students, but again, it's not mandatory. And so with respect to whether medical schools or other graduate schools will honor past grades, we don't have any control over that, but we will obviously advocate for students who elect pass as an option under these uh, unusual circumstances. Thank you. So the next set of questions have to do with enrollment management. Due to the pandemic, the U.S. Embassy is not accepting any for the student for student visas how will the school address and assist new incoming students regarding their inability to apply for a visa and, and Ray you might want to also weigh in on this one sure so um, yeah and I think it would be good if Ray uh, could comment as well um, at this point in time the university is doing everything possible to make sure that we offer admission and um, also work with students on their immigration paper paperwork notwithstanding of course that's really difficult at this point in time to get a visa in the case where uh, students are unable to leave their home country to come here in the fall we're currently and I, I mentioned this before we're currently working on arrangements that would make it possible for students to uh, join us uh, remotely um, and actually travel to the US for the spring semester at which point we would have them move in that includes a full breadth of orientation and other introductory options over the summer that students may uh, join us uh, in as they get ready to and prepare to be a UConn student through those offerings. I'll turn it over to Ray for additional. Hi everyone, I just want to echo that the university is still issuing I-20 forms for students who are admitted for fall and that we're watching the situation very closely with visa services, with travel, with um, entry restrictions, and we recognize that there may need to be some flexibility uh, as we work with um, individual students to try to get here. Um, we understand that there may need to be um, deferrals of, of uh, you know, I-20 forms to come at a later date, like, like Nathan mentioned. We just, we know that there may need to be some flexibility and we're watching the circumstances very closely. Thank you. Uh Another financial just came in. Will you kind of consider lowering tuition since it is it is a hard time for us? And that might also leak into a aid question for Nathan. We we are not considering lowering tuition. Um, we um, uh, your your education is valuable. Um, uh, it costs money to provide the education to you. We, we, our, our goal is to continue to provide a high quality experience for you, whether it's online or in person. Um, we uh, are looking and are trying to be flexible financially around those services such as housing, dining, and parking that students may not be using. Um, and, and that's why we've refunded those, uh, uh, those fees. Um, but uh, tuition is so important uh, to maintaining our academic quality that we are not uh, currently looking at discounting tuition any further thank you so here's a nice question um can we provide a video tour and a virtual tour of uconn for new incoming international students so yeah i can comment on this so there'll be a number of um, opportunities to uh, for incoming students to connect with their advisor to connect with orientation leaders um, and do uh, and to frankly meet each other 
um, as they get ready to join us here in the fall. There are some online videos and things that are available today on the YouTube channel for the university. Uh, so students can check that out. Also, students can attend an online session, a presentation uh, by our staff in the Ludwig Visitor Center. And look sometime soon for us to have additional options available as we add those. There is a Yukon Bound Day uh, coming up in about a week uh, where students will have an opportunity to hear from faculty, students, and uh, leadership from different services on campus who are going to be giving presentations over a matter of days. Um, and you'll be able to ask questions. So international, new international students are invited to join in on those as well. So now we have a couple of questions for the graduate school um, and graduate students. What will happen with graduate assistantship position in the fall if the pandemic can continue to affect teaching and research? So there are some things we know and some things we don't know. Uh, one thing we know is that one way or another, the university will be teaching courses this fall, and many of those courses will, re will require the aid or assistance of teaching assistants. And so certainly teaching assistants associated with courses that, being, that are being taught will have positions. In addition, the university remains committed to remaining active in research. In many cases, students who are appointed to research assistants ships will actually be able to continue to work remotely because of the nature of their work allows them to work remotely. The question remains with respect to how much research will happen on campus for students and faculty who are engaged in research that needs access to materials and, and laboratory facilities. That remains an open question. We are hopeful that some level of activity will be able will be possible in the fall, but we do not yet know. Can the graduate um, can the graduate admission office waive the GRE or English English proficiency requirements for new incoming international grad students because in person tests were canceled in many locations? So two questions: is the GRE and then there's the English proficiency? Yeah. So there, there are two questions there, but actually the answer to both of them is similar. Um, starting last January, when we first became aware that testing sites were clo closing in many countries. The graduate school changed its procedures to allow applications to be considered by programs uh, without GRE scores or TOEFL or IELTS scores for English proficiency so that the applications could have were considered even then. Uh, since then, we have also been encouraging programs to consider applications as they have them, even without GRE scores. And so th those um, processes should be happening. More recently, uh, a little over a month ago, we, adopt, we adopted a new English proficiency test, the Duolingo test, which actually allows test takers to take the test at their home, at a laptop, or a personal computer without going to a remote site. More recently than that, the Educational Testing Service has made available similar technology, both for the graduate record exam and for TOEFL. So that the major tests are now, in fact, available to students from their own homes if they have a laptop or a PC with internet access. Thank you. The next set of questions are for global affairs and particularly the International Students and Scholar Services Office. A broad question about how is university supporting international students during this time? I think Ray, Ray you can handle that question. Sure. So we know that the global COVID-19 pandemic has really been impacting international students since the beginning of spring semester, when students had their travel plans disrupted, trying to come back to the U.S. Um, and we know that students had to miss out on important family celebrations related to Lunar New Year. So this has been impacting international students for actually quite some time. Um, so throughout this whole semester, our advising staff at ISSS has been working tirelessly to help uh, support individual students and resolve individual situations. And we've been um, sharing information that's, um, you know, important and impacting international students with the greater Yukon community. Um, when the pandemic began to impact operations here, um, the university made sure that global affairs staff were included 
in the two um, greater university-wide town halls specifically to uh, address questions impacting international students. Um, and as we've heard, Res Life has made sure that international students who are unable to travel home would be able to stay in their on-campus housing. Um, at ISSS, we've been providing um, a number of virtual meetings. So those have been general information sessions related to, to travel and visas. Um, we've been providing our OPT workshops online to students, um, and we're now holding weekly check-in meetings every Friday that are open to all international students and scholars, and also the greater Yukon community. Um, we also hold daily chat advising, um, and our advisors are also available for remote appointments with students, so please reach out if you need help. Um, and just today, we let students know that Global Affairs has launched an initiative called Yukon Global at Home, and this is part of the greater Yukon Kindness. Uh, initiative, um, and it's specifically intended to help international students stay connected to each other um, and to the Yukon community. So please check your inboxes for more information about that. Um, and then finally, we've been providing regular outreach by emails and other channels to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information to stay informed, to stay healthy, and to maintain your visa status. Uh, so if you have any other suggestions about how we can better support you, please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Ray. And let me add that um, as this crisis changed, um, we spend more and more time at Global Affairs talking about how do we connect with the international students and scholars that are that are home um, in this country, in this state. Um, we spend a lot of time on that, and we're really committed to connecting with you. And it's really important that you feel free to reach out to us as well, because there's lots of initiatives. You know, UConn Kind is sort of a big umbrella. Within an umbrella, there's all kinds of things going on at Global Affairs, at the Graduate School, um, Asian, Asian American Studies. So we're really anxious to work with you because we know that you can feel very isolated. You know, we all feel isolated. We're all stuck at home. It's a very strange time. None of us have ever experienced anything like this. So it's really important that you reach out um, and connect with us because we're really anxious to connect with you. Another question, um, I want to travel home this summer. How do I get my travel signature if ISSS is currently closed? Yep. So right now, um, ISSS staff are all working from home and we're generally not handling paper applications. Um, but we know a lot of students do have plans to uh, travel home this summer. Um, so what we are telling students is uh, you should submit your travel signature request through the ISSS website. Uh, reach out if you're not sure where to find that application. And if we reopen before you leave, you'll be able to come and pick up your travel signature before you go. But if we're still working remotely and you're planning to depart, you should just leave the United States without your travel signature on your I-20 form. It's okay to leave the US without a valid travel signature. Then when we reopen, we will send you an email and provide you with instructions for having your document shipped to you at home. So we'll make sure that you get your I-20 with travel signature before you come back, but it might be a matter of us shipping it to you at home. Thank you. Um, what happens to research in summer? Will you kind of open labs in August? This is important for grad students. So there's a number of you could, could address that question. I guess the answer to that question depends on what the decisions made. Yeah, please, please, Tom. Uh, this is really a, a question for our VPR, Radenka Merrick, who's leading our group that's working on this uh, all the time. <clears throat> and I'll paraphrase for her. Uh, you know, the, the what we're looking for is a, a the cue that we can go back safely, and so that is a combination of things. But largely, you're looking for the. <clears throat> the flattening of the curve to turn over and a signal also from the governor that um and the cdc that it's safe to begin to go back to resuming uh operations and then at that point um the bpr's office is is uh going to begin to allow the the research labs to open again and uh, there's a plan and a process that they're working on to assess which ones can open first based on health and health safety. So those labs where 
people are working largely uh, by themselves or in a large space where they're not um, uh, in physical proximity of each other, uh, will likely be able to, to go first. And then there'll need to be some sort of plans and, and staging for those who are working in very crowded labs. So that's, that's the work that the VDR's office is undertaking now. No one knows the exact date. Um, you know, one can hope that the, the curve peaks in, in May, as is predicted by much of the, of the infectious disease models and begins to come, come back down so that we should have a clearer picture in, in June or July as to when we can go back. But with, no one knows the answer exactly to, to that question right now. Thank you. Thank you. So back to ISSS questions. If I return to my home country this summer, will I be able to return to the US this fall? So there is some risk involved in traveling um, uh, related to returning in the fall. So um, right now, you know, U.S. visa services are currently not operational. So if you'll need to renew your visa, uh, that could be a barrier. Um, there are also entry restrictions still in place for travelers who are arriving from certain designated countries. And we don't know when those entry restrictions will be lifted. We don't know if more entry restrictions will be in place, we don't know if there will be restrictions on traveling to the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns at this point, and therefore there is risk involved with uh, travel that you may not be able to return to the start of fall semester. However, uh, for some students, we understand that you may feel safer at home, and that's really the, the uh, benefit that may outweigh any risks involved with travel. Um, so if you do choose to travel home, ISSS will work with you to make sure you have the most up-to-date travel documents for return. To We'll help advise you on your individual circumstances and make sure you have the most up-to-date information to try to get you back as soon as you can. can. International students who remain in the United States take courses online this fall and, and maintain their visa status. So this is a good question. Um, normally, international students on student visas are very restricted um, in the number of online courses that you're allowed to take. Only one online course can count toward your full-time enrollment. Um, and given the current emergency circumstances that have led to all courses going online, um, the U.S. government has made an exception to this rule that allows international students to remain in the U.S. with a full online course load. Um, as we don't really know what fall semester is going to look like, um, what we can do is kind of um, think about different situations. And I think if the situations are still um, serious enough that the university courses remain entirely online, I would anticipate that the same allowance for international students to take online courses um, would still be in place, but we would really need to await government guidance to confirm that. But if the university goes back to having, you know, fully operational face-to-face -face courses, then I would anticipate that international students who are in the United States would need to take most of their courses face-to-face -face as well. Thank you. Um, here's a question that just came in. If we need visa extensions, extension and embassies are shut down, what should we do? So this depends on whether you're inside the United States or outside the United States. If you're inside the United States and your visa expires, that's okay because your visa is just an, a document that's needed to enter the United States. Once you're in the United States, as long as you have an active I-20 or an active DS-2019 and you're doing all the things necessary to, to follow the visa rules, your visa can expire and that's okay. But if you leave the United States or if you're currently located outside the United States, you will need to wait to renew your visa before you'll be able to come back. And so that's where it's going to be a matter of watching the, um, the visa services very closely. You could try to make an, a visa appointment at this time um, and see what kind of a, a, an appointment date that you get. And you can contact your ISSS advisor if you need any help with that or help trying to get an expedited appointment. Thank you. Is there another? What options do graduating international students have if they are unable to return home this summer after finishing their program? 
This is a question that we get a lot. Um, if you're on an F-1 visa, you actually have a 60-day grace period to remain in the United States after you finish your program. Um, so this gives you a little bit of a window of time to stay even after you've graduated. If you're on a J-1 visa, you get a 30-day grace period. Um, but right now, the, the U.S. government has granted some extensions to J-1 visa holders as well. Um, so for those students who are on the F-1 visas, if you're concerned about your grace period time running out, I would suggest that you contact your ISSS advisor as there may be different options for you to extend your stay a little bit longer through benefits like the OPT or if you're planning to stay in the United States for another academic program anyway, and we could work with you to help you get a new I-20 for that program. But reach out to your advisor with your individual situation. Thank you. So some questions have come in that relate to some of the earlier conversation. One is, can students in the residence hall in the summer be assigned single rooms instead of double rooms due to health concerns? We would certainly accommodate um, medical provisions that are made, those are communicated to us from our doctors as we provide for the medical needs of our students. If there are students with disabilities that we need to accommodate, um, that we're told to do that through the Center for Students with Disabilities and students need to contact them to request provisions as, um, uh, and have the contribution of their provider as well. And here's the question about bias, which is very important, but not an easy answer. Does UConn have plans to prevent bias incidents? You know, I think that's one where many of us will have some thoughts to share. And um, Angela, sorry, go ahead. And Angela will certainly be one of them. I would maybe start us by saying, of course, we want to do everything and anything that we can to prevent bias, because this is not a community that um, values anyone less than any other. And that is how we thrive in our values as an institution. We don't um, choose which opinion is of worth or which identity is of worth over another. We cannot function successfully as an institution if we don't value every single individual. And so, yes, we have a responsibility to educate others about that. Um, we have the responsibility to respond when we're notified. And we have the responsibility and goal of making sure this is a culture that is welcoming and not hateful. And so that's why it's a hard question, because while we hold these values, they are often in tension with the actions of some. And so we will keep pursuing those values, whether it is to prevent, to educate, or to respond. And Angela, I know you have thoughts on this and care deeply about it as well. Thanks, Ellie. I, I do think, as Ellie said, this is a responsibility of all of us. All of us that are here on this panel, I know, are dedicated to uh, eliminating racism and bias as we can, but we know it exists. And so that's why it's important for us at this time if there is something that is happening to you, we need to know that so that we can provide the best response and the best solution to eliminating this on our campus and in our communities. And so I know in the Asian and Asian American community particularly, that incidences of bias usually are underreported. Um, and this is not the time for us to be underreporting. This is really a critical time for us to come together uh, and to be able to say, this is what's happening. And if it's difficult for you to do that, please reach out to all of us and any of us. The cultural centers are there, the studies institutes are there, the Office for Diversity and Inclusion, the Office for Internet, uh, Institutional Equity, we're all here to help you. And so um, if we can tackle this, issue together, I think will be a stronger community for it. Thanks, Angela. I would, I would just add, I, I really would be remiss, and I don't think I've had the chance to do this personally, um, uh, in not thanking President Katsileas, who has addressed this many times over the past several weeks as we've been concerned in his written communication, in his video to others. And um, I can tell you as, as, a, as an employee at UConn, it means a lot to me to see the president um, being so direct in his lack of tolerance for this behavior. So thank you, Tom. 
Thank you, Ellie and, and Angela. And just to underscore what both of you have said, um, you know, I feel strongly as we all do here that every everyone has a right to uh, an edu pursue their education in a, in a place and environment that is uh, safe for them and free from harassment. And that, uh, as Angela said, we all have an obligation to speak out uh, for those values that, uh, that we care about and, and must defend. Uh, and in society uh, at large, um, you know, our role as an educational institution is to prepare independent th thinkers uh, with the, the tools and with the, the courage uh, to speak out when they encounter bias at large in society and uh, to be unafraid uh, to speak for what they really care about and what they value in the world. And I hope if we do our jobs right, that, that we will empower you as our students uh, to carry that on and, uh, and fight that battle with us. And, and together, as Angela, I think, said, we will prevail. I'd also like to give a shout out to our undergraduate student government and our graduate student senate because they, too, uh, have done some incredible work, over, particularly over the past year, in combating the issues of racism and discrimination on our campus. And so if you feel that going to your fellow students is a better way, um, they also want to hear because we're working with them as well. So there are many, many avenues we can all choose to go through. Uh, just know that um, it's it's not relegated to one particular place on campus. It's it's everywhere. So we're here to help you. Thank you. Um, time goes quickly, and we are now approaching one hour. Um, let me say that um, many of you have sent in specific visa questions, um, and you should contact ISSS directly around your very specific personalized visa questions. Let me also conclude by saying that the people on the screen here are just a small group of people that are spending a lot of time thinking about you, planning around things for you, and to be quite honest about it, worrying about you, because we know that you are sheltered in place, we know that you're all over the place, we know that you're in apartments, we know that you're in dorm rooms, we know that some of you are concerned about going to, you know, common eating places. There's a lot going on right now, and so we're really trying very hard to be as, as connected and as responsive as possible. But the most important message I think all of us can give you today is that we care about you, we're thinking about you, and it's really important that you reach out to us too. Um, because the good news is, is we have this virtual connection now, which is wonderful. I think sometimes what would have happened 25 years ago if we had this pandemic and we didn't have the internet? It would have been a very different world. So we're fortunate for the, for the for connectedness. I want to thank President Castellanos for your leadership and your caring. Um, it's very, very important. Um, your message coming from the President's office is penetrating throughout the campus. I want to thank the panel. And I want to thank all the participants today for your questions today, your questions in the past. And the most important thing is keep asking questions. That's, where, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much. And thank you to the IT staff for making this happen. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.